Hey guys, come back to Bumble TV. If you're new here, do make sure to like, share, subscribe to my channel. Today we're going to be checking out one of your suggestions, guys. We're going to be checking out how gender difference lead to different outcomes for men and women, guys. This is going to be thinking by Jordan Peterson, guys. We know who he is. We know he is good. Like I love the way he's able to compose himself. Like speak some certain words. Like the calmness, the the outcome of his words are always amazing. Guys, let's get straight into this. The rules such as they are, you know, they seem very commonsensical. They could apply to anyone. Hmm. Um, so is that a fair surmise of why you get so attacked? Uh, th that just the very fact that you're willing to speak about the sexes as being not unequal, but different, different but equal. Yeah. Well, you know, I would say that that's part of it because there's a threat there. Right. So one of the things that happened when I was in Scandinavia, I just wrote a column about this actually. Um, it was interesting being in Scandinavia, especially in Sweden, because they pushed the equality of opportunity doctrine farther than any other country in they the world. They invented it. It mm -hmm. all started there, mm -hmm. in the, yeah. like in the UN, in the original, you know, the charter. The Swedes were there, and they they've never given up. No, no, and so, and. The week that I was there was the same week that two articles were published on gender differences um, in, in temperament and in interest. And the biggest sex differences that we know of that aren't morphological are in interest. So women are more interested in people, by and large, and men are more interested in things, by and large. And the difference is actually large. It's one standard oh. deviation. And so that means if you're a man, you would have to be more interested in people than 85% of men to be as interested as 50% of women. And if you're a woman, you'd have to be more interested in things than 85% of women to be as interested as the 50th percentile male. So the difference is actually quite substantial. And it's certainly large enough to drive occupational choice differences. And it, wh it, which explains, it does. A, explains a lot about oh, yes. the configuration of people in the workplace. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, and you know, we're approach, approaching parity in terms of workplace, overall workplace distribution of men right. and women, but there's massive differences in occupational choice. Like, it's very interesting, for example, to go to the website of the U.S. Labor uh, Department and look at male and female dominated industries. And, you know, there's the, the top 10 male dominated industries have z basically zero women in them. People, so bricklayers they, being they, one of them. Like people, there are people-free yeah. zones, uh, no. according to Camille Paglia. That you find there's a lot of men in the people-free zones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the I, women are, you know, you ask a group of women and men, would you rather spend the next three weeks taking apart a machine and putting it together or helping a group of people work out their problems? And the pool of people who want to do the machine, it's just far more mm. men than women. Well, and there's more men in women-dominated industries than there are women in men dominated industries at the extreme. So that's so kind of like, that's would, kind would of that be like nursing? Nursing, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah so there's way pay, more male nurses than the there male are female nurses, bricklayers. Cool. I've studied these male nurses and they, they already, uh, you know, gender activists are upset because they earn more than women. Mm -hmm. And a, a professor of nursing at University of Pennsylvania tried to find out why. Mm -hmm. And she found out they immediately find out what's the best paying field. Mm -hmm. Subfield, so they go into like nurse anesthesiology. It pays a lot more. The men are there in disproportionate number, and they're willing to work in you know insane hours. They're far more willing to move to, move, to a yeah. higher. Same thing Farrell field. found with with gender yeah. differences is that men are more willing to move. Millie they're more willing, more willing to willing work to longer commute. hours. Yeah, they're more willing to to uh, work outside. They're more willing to take on dangerous tasks. They're yeah. more likely to work in scalable industries. Mm -hmm. So, like, you can't scale personal care. It's really very, it's very, very difficult. They're much less likely to work part time. If they have small businesses, they're much more likely to work full time in the small business rather than this than part time. Yeah. And I mean, women have their reasons to want to work part time. And Farrell also pointed out that if you work 10% longer hours, you make 40% more money. A non-linear, yeah. non-linear return on overtime. That's something that's really useful to know. You know, and, it's and, and in terms of your career beneficial planning. to an employer. Yeah. That yeah. have some well, it also work. marks you out, you know, like if you have 10 employees and they're all doing a reasonable job, let's say, but one of them is working an extra half an hour a day or 45 minutes a day, and you can observe that every day, then that gives them an edge with regards to potential promotion. Yeah. And so, and the return on those edges is nonlinear. And so, 
Anyway, so I went to Scandinavia and it was the same week that two studies were released showing what had already been established beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the personality differences between men and women and the differences in interest as well actually get bigger as your society gets richer and as it gets more egalitarian. And, and not just a little bit either, that's the other thing that's so interesting is you might think, well, the effect is it's the opposite of what the social constructionists would predict, first of all. So that's the first thing to point out. Is it's not only that their hypothesis wasn't supported, it was decidedly refuted. And, and none of them have come to terms with that. And, and, and it's not a small effect. The, the, the difference between personality between men and women in Scandinavia is a lot larger than it is in non-egalitarian countries. Like in rural Botswana. But, mm -hmm. but that's yeah. also true yeah. in the United States. The richer the demographic your household, the demographic your household, the more likely mm -hmm. the woman is to take time out and be at home with the kids. Right. Because right. she, she can afford to do it. She can yeah. afford to do yeah. it, and um, she can afford to major in. Well, Odd, you know, low-paying fields like uh, I don't know, feminist dance therapy or something. <laughs> well, the other the other thing you 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 see too is that what, one of the things that's also interesting, I think, is that you know there's this idea that ma that marriage is a patriarchal institution, you know, that's primarily put there for the for the utility of the of the male, and you think well, like I think that's complete bloody rubbish, and, and I don't think there's any evidence to support it at all. But I think the best counter evidence is that well, if that's the case, then rich people shouldn't be getting married because they don't have to oppress themselves. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, is that the higher your demographic position, the more likely you are to be married. So marriage has fallen apart among, you know. And the, the more likely the wife is staying home and, but not, I mean, she has all sorts of pursuits, but what, mm -hmm. she's not. Well, there's an old mm -hmm. saying, anyone, any woman who marries for money earns it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now let yeah. me just, okay, this is where you might get in a little trouble. Because in your book, you call men order and women chaos. And you say, order, the known, appears symbolically associated with masculinity, and mm -hmm. chaos, the eternal feminine, is also the crushing force of sexual selection. Yeah, what's mm -hmm. up with that? Yeah, we chaotic. Okay. Well, you find us well, chaotic. Well, it isn't men and women that are order and chaos. It's masculinity and femininity symbolically. And so what's happened fundamentally is that we're, our brains are wired for social cognition. So we're not natural scientists, we're natural sociologists. That might be a better, even though I shudder to think that that might be true. Especially or given the maybe, state of sociology. Yes, well, that's it. <laughs> okay, Although, triggering, or maybe, triggering. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, may, or maybe we're more, we're more naturally uh, people who observe through the lens of fiction, and that what we see is the world as characterized. And the, the world, obviously is made out of men and women and children yeah. and those seem to be our fundamental cognitive categories masculinity femininity and 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 then the category of children and those categories have expanded to take on connotations outside of of pure person perception and so you know it's for this reason that if you go to a movie and maybe it's a Disney animated movie and I, I like to talk about those because they draw on a very deep symbolic well. It's perfectly reasonable to see a witch that lives in a swamp because those go together. Like it makes sense. You know, the, the witch doesn't live in a gleaming chrome high rise. Yeah. You know, she lives in a swamp because that's and maybe well, in a shack. for her and, broom, and, I think. She could just yeah. fly out. Well, the that's door. it. That's, yeah, it, well, the high rise would be better for <laughs> right, the broom, right? right, right because right, right. you could take <laughs> off, you could take <laughs> off better. But there are categories of, of symbolic association that are natural to the way we think. And the fundamental elements of those categories seem to be gendered. And so this is partly why I make reference to Taoism, for example. So for the Taoists, the world is made out of chaos and order. And chaos is the domain that you don't understand and that emerges unpredictably, but also the domain from which new forms emerge. Right? Because it's from novelty that, that the new emerges. And I think the fundamental association between femininity and chaos is the association between what's unexpected and novel and what's new. Because new forms emerge from chaos. And it's not that chaos is, is bad and order is good. That, that's no, not both, both have their pathologies. Hmm. Both have their, their pathologies. And their virtues. Yeah, yes, and, and, and what you're looking for, and, and this, is, this is what the book concentrates on above all, is that you're looking constantly to find the balance between those two. So, right. For example, formally speaking, 
the domain of order is that place that you are when what you're doing is producing the results that you want to have produced. So imagine, imagine, think about the preconditions for not being anxious. Okay, so the preconditions are that you're constantly making predictions about what's going to happen next. And those predictions are tied tightly to your behavioral output. So you act in a certain way and you presume that a certain thing is going to happen. And if your actions produce the results that you desire, then you assume that you know where you are and you know what you're doing and that your plan is intact and that the environment is secure and that keeps your anxiety under control. That's order. And then, you know, maybe you're at a party and you don't know anybody and you tell a joke and everybody looks at you like what you said was not only not funny but also <laughs> downright offensive. Yes. And then all of a sudden you've moved from the domain of order into the domain of chaos because you thought you were somewhere and you thought you were someone and you thought you were with people that were of a certain type and you got all that wrong. <laughs> and so it You're calls... also suggesting it is going to be the woman who says, I find that really offensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. But, but you know, it, but it, it probably it is. Was. Never mind. But Never. women are also more sensitive to negative emotion. Right. So there is some slightly higher probability that that might be the case. But then I think women are also associated, at least in men's imaginations, with nature, which is part of the chaotic domain, say, as opposed to culture, because they're sexually selective. So you've you got to think, what, what is nature? I mean, we have that as a cognitive category, right? We think of the natural world, we think of nature versus culture. It's a fundamental opposition. What is nature? Well, nature is trees and landscapes and animals and all of that, uh, but that isn't what nature fundamentally is. Nature fundamentally is that which selects from a genetic perspective. Mm. That's nature. That's the fundamental definition of nature. And it is the case that human females are sexually selective. And it's, it's a major component of human behavior. So the, the evolutionary theory, roughly speaking, is that the reason we diverged from chimpanzees 8 million years ago, 7 million years ago, is at least in part because of the differences between sexual selectivity between female humans and female chimpanzees. Female chimpanzees are more likely to have offspring from dominant males, but it's not because of their sexual selectivity. So a female chimpanzee has periods of fertility that are marked by physical uh, by observable physiological changes. Not the case with human females. Human female ovulation is, is um, concealed. So that's a very profound biological difference between human females and chimpanzees. And the chimpanzee females will mate with any male, but the dominant males chase the subordinate males away. But human females are sexually selective, and, so, and, and it's not a trivial fact. So you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. You think, well, how can that be? Well, imagine that on average, every single human female has had one child throughout the entire course of history, which is approximately correct, by the way. Then imagine that half of the men had zero and the other half had two. Okay, and that's roughly the case. So half of males, historically speaking, have been reproductive disasters. And the reason for that hmm. is because of female sexual selectivity. So it is actually the case that female humans are nature. It's not only that they're, that, that they're associated with nature symbolically. As far as reproduction is concerned, they are the force of nature that does the selection. And so they're nature in the most fundamental way. And there is a chaotic element of that, at least in relationship to men, and also in relationship to women, because a lot of the um, female on female competition is competition that's chaotic for the right to be sexually selective, right? Not only with regards to men, which drives a lot of politicking, but also in relationship to each other, because part of what human females do is jockey for position in the female dominance hierarchy for the top position, which is the woman who gets to be most sexually selective. And so that drives female-female competition, and it's a different dynamic. There's, there's similarities between female-female competition and male-male competition, but there are also differences, and they're pronounced. But so men, for example, are, well, men are more likely to compute, compete for socioeconomic status, and that's partly because that drives female mate choice. Yeah. So the correlation for men between socioeconomic status and sexual su success is about 0.6, and for women it's zero. Yeah. Zero. In fact, it's actually slightly negative. Yeah. So, and that's a huge difference between men and women. 
but do you know that do you know the anthropologist Sarah Hurdy, H R D Y, and and she's like my favorite feminist theorist. Although as she would say, I'm a theorist who happens to be a feminist. But she studied primate behavior, and she watched. She looked at the women very care the, the females and not women mm -hmm. very carefully, and looked at at uh, chimpanzees and gazelles and so and found that um, the the female, initially, like male primatologists would look and say, oh, the females, the males are dominant and the females are so cooperative. Mm -hmm. She looked more carefully mm -hmm. and saw the females weren't exactly cooperative. Like they would pass around their infant, their baby, you know, whatever mm -hmm. they were, and would find, and, and so the male primatologist would say, oh, they're, they're so kind and caring. She found out that when it was not your Mm -hmm. It was not hers. They would take like little tufts of hair, you know, it would come out, or they'd do something to the eyes, yeah. and, and the baby would like be injured. <laughs> and she saw all this violence. Especially but it was true covert. when there's status differentiation. Yes. So it's much more likely that'll happen when a higher status female is taking care of a lower status infant. Exactly. Yeah, and she yeah. said the great tragedy, well, not tragedy, she said the reality of our species. And in fact, the, the subtitle for her book is the, the Woman Who Never Evolved. We didn't evolve for niceness and cooperative. There's Im immense competition. And we can, according to her, we are, it's indelibly you know, marked in our nature to compete for the dominant males. Oh, and yes, no doubt about that. There's, yeah. and, so, and that seems too cross-culturally as well. That does exactly. flatten out a little bit in the more egalitarian societies. Yeah. So instead of being exaggerated, it does flatten to some degree. Right. So you could imagine that there's a biological component and a cultural component. Of and, course, and both. In, in, in that case, if you modify the cultural component, then that seems to decrease the overall. So, like, let me be more clear about this. Women are less prone to mate up, across and up, status hierarchies in Scandinavia than they are in less egalitarian countries. But they're still prone to do it. So worldwide, for example, women, young women, find men who are about four years older than them maximally attractive. And they tend to mate across and up status hierarchies. And so one of the consequences of that, for example, is that as women have entered the workforce, they've actually driven inequality. Because rich women will only marry rich men. Men as rich as them or richer. Whereas rich men will marry women who are poorer than them. But women won't. And so what that yeah. means is it's another factor that's pooling wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer people. It's, so, it's a sort of mating, yeah. now, and you just find someone with your background. Whereas a doctor might have once married his secretary, he now marries another doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I ask then, stepping a little bit back from primates as well, how does this um, selection work in the era of swiping right and left? <laughs> how, what is your reaction to the way young people date today. Oh, that's a good, I was really hoping we'd get into that. I was really, because well, you were I, well, very into the monkeys, so yeah, I didn't want yeah. to interrupt No, it. no. <laughs> well, well, I should close off the Scandinavian discussion just by pointing out, and, and this is something that the Scandinavians are really going to have to wrestle with, is that if you institute effective policies to promote equality of opportunity, which the Scandinavians have done, you're going to produce some equality, so like a 50-50 distribution of men and women in the workplace, but you're also going to exacerbate certain kinds of inequality, and you can't get out of that. So you cannot have equality of opportunity and equality of outcome together. They don't yeah. work together. And equality of outcome, the essential equality of outcome doctrine, which is often described with the code word equity, is that at every level of every occupation, the people have to be represented by the same number that they're represented in at the population. So if it's not 50-50 men and women at each, in each occupation and in, and in each strata at each occupation, then that's sort of prima facie evidence for discrimination and for systemic discrimination. It's like, nope, sorry, you have to factor in choice, and choice actually turns out to be a very important determinant. And as the society gets flatter and flatter, choice becomes a more, important, a more and more important determinant. And so, you, so what that essentially means is that the most radical end of the left-wing political agenda is logically impossible, apart and, from and, the and, fact and that it's impossible for a variety of other reasons. Whoa. Why? 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 Guys, why? Like, I'm really, really enjoying myself. Like, listen to his 
listen to them saying things like like it's amazing what do you think about it do you feel they are equal or not for me for me personally i feel male and female we have our similarities but we're different like we're different we have things we do differently like hmm what do you think guys what do you think leave your comments in my comment section guys like I feel me are dominant, but this 50-50 stuff isn't really working for me, guys. Guys, what do you think? Leave it in the comment section, guys. Guys, please sure to like, share, subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time, guys, first.